Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanisha Cole Edmonds. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the CFTC's Chief Diversity Officer and Director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. I also want to offer an inclusive introduction of myself. I am an African-American woman with brown eyes and shoulder length curly hair. I am currently wearing glasses and I also am wearing a black blazer with a black shirt underneath. Welcome to day two of the CFTC Career Forum for college, university, and law school students and recent graduates. If you are so inclined, we'd love for you to share and chat your name, where you're from, and what school you are attending or what school you graduated from. Let's create some community. We had an amazing in-person day one yesterday, which featured opening remarks from our chairman, Rostin Benham, and each of the CFTC's commissioners, Commissioner Kristen Johnson, Summer Mer Mersinger, Christy Goldsmith Romero, and Carolyn Pham. I also delivered remarks and Alex Trimble, founder and CEO of GPS Leadership Solutions delivered an incredible keynote on leading for the common good, unleashing your potential in public service. We closed with an in-person career fair during which every operating division, the Office of Technology Innovation and Office of Chief Economist sent representatives to stay at the table. Our executive director, Jeff Sutton, general counsel, Rob Schwartz, and division of enforcement director, Ian McGinley, attended in person. And both Rob and Jeff personally staffed their tables, which was awesome. We also had a representative from the Office of Personnel Management yesterday join us to answer questions about the federal hiring process and careers. And our online attendees stayed on to hear a virtual presentation from internal HR talent, from, from our internal HR talent management team on careers at the CFTC while we held an in-person fair from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time yesterday. Every operating division sent representatives to, oh, excuse me, every operating division, as I already said, sent representatives to staff the table. We're looking forward to another amazing afternoon today. A total of 650 students and recent graduates registered for the forum, and we are so glad to have many of you join us today. Collectively, the registrants represent over 200 colleges and universities, including minority-serving institutions, women's colleges, and law schools, studying law, data science, computer science, finance, accounting, and economics, among other majors. As our day two agenda reflects, we will be kicking off the afternoon with a presentation from Lauren Foreman from the Office of Personnel Management on navigating USA jobs. As she is uh, delivering her presentation, please feel free to drop any question in the chat. And as time permits, we will get to them. Now a brief introduction of Lauren before she begins her presentation today. Lauren was born in Brooklyn, New York, and upon completing her diploma, she attended the College of New Rochelle before enlisting in the United States Navy in 2008. While on active duty, she graduated with her bachelor's in healthcare administration and a master's in human resources management. In 2014, she finished her enlistment in the Navy and after graduating from college, she was recruited under the Pathways Recent Graduate Program to work for the USA Jobs Program Office at the Office of Personnel Management. Lauren, thank you for joining us and on to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Lauren Foreman, and I am an engagement specialist with the USA Jobs Program Office. My pronouns are she and her. Um, to describe myself, I am a Black female. I have um, shoulder length locks, and I am wearing a green turtleneck. I am also wearing brown glasses. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay, perfect. 
All right, good afternoon, everyone. So today we're going to go over navigating USA Jobs. If you've never heard of USA Jobs, it is the federal website where most agencies post their federal vacancies. If you're looking for any opportunities in the federal government, USA Jobs is the place to start. Um, it's very easy to create a profile and we'll show you that in a second. But when you come to USA Jobs, you'll come to the landing page. On the landing page, you can search for opportunities in the federal government by job title. You can search by department or agency Agency. If you know of a specific agency like CFTC who's hosting this event and you really want to have opportunities and find opportunities for a particular agency, you can search for jobs by an agency. Um, you can also search by series and occupation. Um, if you're not familiar with series, don't get too hung up on that. Um, sometimes the system will educate you through your search experience and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. You can also search for opportunities in the federal government by location. There are many federal opportunities all over the United States and there's even some opportunities overseas. So you can search for those opportunities by using the location search. Um, anytime there's an important news going on, um, USA Jobs has a, an alert banner for you. Um, so right now, the alert that we have on our page is around the Build a Better America Infrastructure Bill. So if you're looking for opportunities around the Infrastructure Bill, which is President Biden's Build a Better America, you can look for opportunities there. When you scroll down to the middle of the page, um, we give you some high level information on how to create a USA Jobs profile. Like I said, it's very easy. Um, once you create a profile, you can save searches, you can monitor your applications, you can upload documents, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, we also give you a high level overview of the application process. Keep in mind, this is very high level because some opportunities may have other additional steps that others don't. So for example, if I had to think on the top of my head, if I was a secret service agent, I know that even though um, on the screen here, we have steps one through eight, I may have some additional steps. Like I may have to take a poly, I may have to take um, a physical, I may have some additional things that I need to do before I can get my official job offer. But at a high level, we give you the idea of what the application process looks like at a high level. But again, keep in mind, depending on the agency and depending on the occupation, you may have some additional steps. Um, if you are looking to see what are some urgent hiring needs in the federal government, you can always click on this tab and we will show you the opportunities. We have some STEM opportunities here. We have tech opportunities. Um, we have some engineering opportunities as well. I did see that somebody put in the chat that they went to school to be an economist. So we have some opportunities in that area as well. So if you wanna see what are some urgent hiring needs that are happening in the government, you can click on that tab and we give you some information there as well. When you scroll down a little bit more, you come to the Exploring Hiring Paths section. Hiring paths are really important on USA Jobs. Come become very familiar with them. You will see these icons all over the place. You'll see them on job announcements. You will see them in your search. You will see them on the events page and you will also see them in your profile. It's a way for you as a job seeker to identify opportunities that are open to you in the government. What's really unique about federal hiring is that not only do you have to be qualified for a job, but you must also be eligible for that job. So the hiring pads give you an idea to show you what jobs you might be eligible for. So if you are a veteran, if you click on that tab, USA Jobs will take you to the Veterans Help Center page where you'll get loads of information on what the criteria is to be a veteran, um, what the point preference is. Um, we'll talk about documentation that you should have in your profile so that when you're applying to opportunities that are open to veterans, the HR specialist knows that you are who you say you are. Same thing for all of the other hiring paths. Many of you are students and recent grads. So if you clicked on the student and recent grad tab on that page, um, you'll come to the student and recent grad help center page where again, we'll give you loads of information about internship and student, recent, and student and recent grad programs. We'll also give you information about documentation that you'll need to have in your profile. So again, when you're applying to those student and recent grad opportunities, you have the documentation in your profile to show that you are indeed a student. Um, um, like they said in the intro, I came in as a student and recent grad. That's how I got my opportunity in the federal government. I used my graduate degree as a way to get my first opportunity um, at OPM. So there's loads of different ways and entry points into federal federal um, employment. We also have hiring paths for individuals with disabilities. We have hiring paths for um, National Guard and Reserve. 
Um, we also have hiring packs for military spouses, veterans, and um, a host of others. So if you want information about what the criteria is for each one of these hiring packs, you can just click into the page and we'll give you a summary of what you're gonna need to have in your profile so that you can apply to those opportunities. If you scroll down a little bit more, you come to the USA Jobs Events section. If you click View More Events, you come to the USA Jobs Events page. And this is my favorite section of USA Jobs because this is where you can get some free training. There are agencies that do resume writing workshops. I believe that tomorrow in your day two, you're going to be learning about some resume tips, right? So that's free training. And so lots of agencies will post those types of things here in the event section. They'll also post hiring events, right? So lots of agencies like care. This is the event that's going on right now. Um, so if you are interested in seeing what events are happening in your area, there are events that are virtual and there are also events that are in person and they are hosted by a slew of different agencies. So you can see this one is open um, by the Department of State. Sometimes the agency will have a vacancy attached to that, um, that event so you can apply to the vacancy because sometimes they'll be doing on the spot interviews. So I know that Lots of agencies will do that as well. So if you apply to the vacancy before the event, you might be able to get uh, an interview at the event and maybe sometimes a tentative job offer. So definitely check out the USA Jobs events page. Again, this is where agencies are posting their job fairs, their career fairs, and their informational sessions. From here, I'm gonna go back to the USA Jobs landing page. So this is our homepage. I also wanna highlight our help section. So lots of you might have questions even after today. You might be taking notes and you might be saying, I heard about this and you know, I don't remember what Lauren said or you may have heard something in another presentation. A lot of what I'm talking to you about right now is coming from the help center. So any information that I'm presenting to you today came from the Help Center page. I probably researched it myself and looked it up in the Help Center. So I'm telling you, the USA Jobs Help Center it has loads of information. So if you wanted to get information about recent grads, you can type that in here. And then the system is going to give you some information about recent graduate programs, maybe letters of recommendation to obtain for Pathways programs. And so we give you so many recommendations for things that you need help with. Um, we also have some FAQs in here. So if you wanna to come to some of our frequently asked questions, you can come in here and we'll give you a high level answer on some of those questions. So I highly encourage you to come to the USA Jobs Help Center page because there's lots of information in here. I'm gonna come back to the landing page. Um, let me see if I have any questions. I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm gonna go ahead and continue. Um, what I would also suggest is that you create a USA Jobs profile. Creating a USA Jobs profile is really going to take your job search um, to the next level. One, you can't apply for a job unless you have a profile, but you don't wanna just create a profile. You wanna make sure that you are putting all of the great information about your job experience, your military experience, um, your school experience. You wanna make sure that you are doing all of those things in your profile. Yes, I will talk about student and recent graduate opportunities in a second. So yes, I will definitely touch on that. So once you um, create your profile, you will go ahead and sign in. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign into my profile. Give me one second. We use login.gov, which is a third party government authenticated system that helps us safeguard your information. So we, start, we started using two factor authentication um, so that you can log into your USA jobs profile. From your USA Jobs, once you log into your USA Jobs profile, you'll come to your profile and you'll come to your personalized dashboard. You'll come to your personalized dashboard. Um, in this dashboard, you'll have all of the jobs that you've ever applied to. So it's going to give me a list of all the jobs I ever applied to. <clears throat> The applications, the um, application status. So I know that at this particular time, the job is still accepting applications. Um, it's going to also give me a job status once I finish my application. I also have saved jobs on here. So sometimes I might be looking through USA jobs and I may come to an opportunity that I can't apply to right then and there. So at that particular time, I can save a job to my profile so that I can come back to it and apply when I have time. 
I can also create saved searches. So if I'm looking for particular opportunities and I have my saved search um, down pat, I can save that search so I don't have to come to USA Jobs every single day. What the system is going to do is it's going to generate emails to me on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis and suggest opportunities based on that saved search. So sometimes I will get maybe five jobs in my email that says, hey, Lauren, um, these jobs meet the criteria for your safe search, and I can check them out. So you can also create safe searches so that you don't have to come to USA Jobs every single day um, and apply um, and look for opportunities. The system can um, suggest opportunities to you. I'm just going to pause really quickly and just preference in this and say um, I am not an HR specialist. So I know that many of you might be uh, might think that I can ask some of the I can answer some of the HR related questions. I can only answer questions related to USA Jobs and the system in itself. Now I will try my best to touch on a couple of things based on like my experience, but I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm not an HR specialist, and so I can't answer some of those heavy you know HR related questions. Um, but back to your personalized dashboard. So once you come to your dashboard, again, you can monitor your applications, you can look at your saved jobs, and you can look at your saved searches. You can also fill in your profile. So this is all of the information that you are going to be sending to um, the agency when you are filling out um, your applications. You wanna make sure that you're identifying your hiring paths as well. So in my USA Jobs profile, I identify as a veteran. I also identify as an individual with a disability. I'm a military spouse. I'm also a recent grad and a federal employee. So you can select as many hiring paths as you want that, meet, that you meet the criteria for. Also fill in your work experience, your military experience if you have, and all of the other information, again, that is going to be built um, into the information that goes to the agency when you apply. What's also in, um, important about, your, um, about filling out your, your profile is that one, you are allowed to have up to five resumes in your profile, but what's really neat is that you can at least make one searchable. When you make that resume searchable, your information is then pulled into a separate system where HR specialists and hiring managers, like some that are on the line right now, they can find you. So if you allow your information to be made searchable and made public, um, HR specialists and hiring managers can look at you in a separate system. And so if you identify as a veteran, and let's say there's a hiring manager that's looking to hire, hire a veteran, and you meet the skills and the criteria criteria, you can potentially be non-competitively um, pulled into that opportunity. So I highly suggest that you make one of your resumes searchable. Another thing that's important is making sure that you're, up to, you're uploading supporting documentation. What do I mean by supporting documentation? So if you want to apply to student and recent graduate opportunities, how would you let the agency know that you are a student or a recent grad? You would need to upload your transcripts or um, maybe your degree. Um, or if you are a veteran, you would need to at least upload a DD-214. Or if you are an individual with a disability, you would need to upload a letter from your doctor. And so those are the supporting documents that I'm talking about that you need to have in your profile so that when you start applying to these different opportunities that are open to different groups of people, you have the supporting documentation there so that the HR specialist, again, knows who you are. I would also suggest that you fill out your preference information in your profile. You can select um, locations that you're interested in working at, work schedules that you're interested in having, um, and then if you're willing to travel and or if you're willing to relocate. And so that is your USA Jobs profile um, sort of in a nutshell. So I'm going to pause really quickly here and see if I can look at some of the questions in the chat. So um, I think Felicia, Dion, I think that's your question. So it really just depends. I, I see that your question is about if you're a GS7 um, and if you have a master's degree. So I was kind of in the same situation. I had got out the military and I was a GS6 working at the Department of Navy as an EEO assistant. And I had just graduated with my master's degree. 
and I applied to um, a pathways opportunity. So I wasn't using um, my merit system. I wasn't using the fact that I was a current federal employee to apply to that opportunity. It was specifically open to students and recent grads, which I met the criteria for because I had just graduated with my master's degree and I was a GS6 and the position was um, a, nine, a, a 9, 11, 12, 13. And so I know typically you do not, you cannot skip grades in the federal government, but there are caveats to that. Now, I'm not going to say that is the case all the time, but there are caveats to that. So as a GS6, I was able to apply to the pathways, to a pathways opportunity, which is the job that I have right now. Um, and I came in at a GS9. So I went from a six to a GS9 just because I used my master's degree to apply to the vacancy um, because the vacancy was only open to students and recent grads, which was the Pathways program. And so I'm not going to say that as a blanket statement that happens all the time. But um, in some situations, as a current federal employee, you, you can skip grades. But it really just depends on how the vacancy is announced and how the agency is going to be bringing that job seeker on board. So what I will say is, yes, it can happen sometimes. And no, it can happen sometimes. I would definitely just make sure you're looking at that job announcement announcement and reading through to make sure that you are meeting the qualifications and the eligibility for that job. That's why it's important, again, to read through the job announcement, which is a great segue. So um, I hope, Felicia, that that answers your question. So it is possible. All right, so as a job seeker, um, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, you can search by job title, department, agency, series, or occupation. Um, and so let's say I was particularly searching right now, I'm a program analyst. So I am looking for program analyst opportunities in the federal government. And so once I click the search button, what's automatically going to happen now that I am signed into my profile is that USA Jobs is going to use information from our profile to filter out my search results. So because I'm an individual with a disability, because I want to do telework, because I want to work in all of these particular locations, you can see all of these green pills here. All of that information is being pulled from my profile. So the system is automatically generating some filters for me. I can turn that off. I can say, just show me everything. Show me all the program analyst opportunities in the federal government, regardless of the filters that are in my profile. So you can turn those filters on and off. <clears throat> this is where you can save a search. So if at this point you want to save this search, maybe you want to save program analyst opportunities anywhere in the federal government, maybe you want to save that search, you can do that there. Um, if you want to save jobs, maybe you want to, you can't get to them right now, but you want to look at them at a later time, you can, you know, highlight these stars and then you can save those jobs as well. Um, if you want to turn on some additional feature, um, filters on this side, I'm a veteran, I am an individual with a disability. I am a student and a recent grad, and I'm a federal employee. So I'm going to select those four filters when I'm searching in USA Jobs because I know that any one of those filters are saying, this job is open to you, Lauren. So that's why I use those filters. And I can also use open to the public. I highly suggest that everybody use open to the public because the public is encompassing of all of us, right? So everybody should also use the open to the public um, hiring path. That also goes for federal employees. Federal employees can also apply to opportunities that are open to the public because you are the public. And so once I do that, I come here and I'm reading through and I'm looking for some opportunities and I say, ha, program analyst at the Department of Veterans Affairs, um, it is in Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, I have no problem relocating. And so I'm going to click into this job announcement and take a look at it. What I highly suggest that you guys pay attention to as job seekers when you're looking at job announcements is pay attention to the agency name. You know, I think the misconception with job seekers is that the federal government is just one big bucket, but we're not. We have many different agencies like CFTC, the Department of Energy. Um, this one is with the Department of Transportation, Federal Railroad Administration. So there's so many different agencies in the federal government. I highly suggest that when you're looking through USA Jobs, you are paying attention to the agency name, right? So this one is with the Federal Aviation Administration. This is with the Indian Health Service. This is with Medicaid. Um, this is with the Department of Transportation. This is with Army. 
This is the Office of Secret Secretary of Transportation. So there's so many federal agencies. And so I, I, I highly encourage that you pay attention to the agency um, when you are looking at some of these opportunities in the federal government. When you come to the job announcement, um, you'll get a summary about what the job is, and then you'll see, those, you'll see those icons again where it'll say this job is open to. Again, if you have these icons in your profile, then you know, okay, this job is open to me as well. If you see a job announcement and it doesn't have any icons or hiring paths, if you will, um, that you have identified in your profile, it's safe to say that that job is probably not open to someone like you. So you have to make sure that that job is open to you. And again, those hiring paths will be on um, every job announcement. Um, some agencies will also upload a video on their um, job announcements. Um, but what I think is the most important part of the job announcement is the duties. This is what the agency is saying that you need to know how to do. Don't just assume by the job title that you know how to do it, or that if you were a program analyst at your previous job that you can do, you can be a program analyst at the Department of Veterans Affairs. It's important that you're looking through what the agency is saying that they need you to do and make sure that that information is in your resume so that, again, when that HR specialist is looking at that resume, you have highlighted and demonstrated in your resume that you can do what they're saying that this person needs to do. So make sure that you're reading through those duties. Then they'll talk about the requirements and some of the qualifications. Definitely read through qualifications because sometimes you can qualify with work experience or you can substitute experience for education. So if you don't have experience, you can sometimes say, that's what I did. I had no experience as a program analyst, but I had a master's degree. So thankfully for the, for the Pathways program. Um, the Pathways program is kind of where I, I it was, it helped me land where I am right now. And so definitely read through the job announcement because lots of agencies will allow you to um, you know, qualify yourself just by saying that you have um, education. And so I highly encourage you guys, again, read through some of those job announcements. Um, someone asked me to go over the Pathways program. Um, so I'll show you guys that in a second, but I just kind of want to go through the job announcement a little bit more. Um, there's an open and close date. Make sure you pay attention to that. Um, they'll go over the pay scale. The GS pay scale is probably the most um, popular pay scale, but it's not the only pay scale. Um, you can Google the GS pay scale. It's public information. So if you want to see where your salary at your current job right now kind of falls within our GS pay scale, Google it and see where you fall in. Your salary could be between, you know, a GS7 or a GS11, depending on the scale. So you can Google that information. It's public information. Um, it will let you know the location of the job or if the job is remote or if it's telework eligible. Um, it'll let you know if the agency is going to be paying for re um, relocation expenses and uh, lots of other um, helpful information about the job. If there's a drug test, what the security clearance level is um, and things like that. So again, read through the job announcement. It's important to make sure that um, you are looking through the duties and making sure that you have illustrated that you can do the duties that the agency is asking you to do. So David, I believe that you have to be a US citizen to apply to um, opportunities in the federal government. If you're the spouse of a veteran, should you upload your spouse's DD-214? So you don't have to, up, you can upload your spouse's DD-214, but I believe that you have to upload the orders. What I am going to suggest that you do is if you are a military spouse, you come back to the USA Jobs landing page and you come down here and you click on military spouse. When you come to the military spouse help center page, it's going to tell you what criteria you need to meet in order to be identified as a military spouse. Then it's going to tell you what documents you need. Seems here that you can either use a DD-214 or, or a DD-1300. I know that some spouses will even upload um, the, the um, service members active, active duty orders. Come to the USA Jobs Help Center page and make sure that you're looking through to see what documents you'll need. Sometimes the agency will also let you know in the job announcement what document you will need in order to apply to that particular opportunity. So again, come to the USA Jobs Help Center page um, with your questions. It'll let you know exactly what documents you need. So again, for here, 
a military spouse, it seems that you can use the DD-214 or the DD-1300. Um, so another person asked me to talk about some of the recent grad programs. So if you come back to the USA Jobs Help Center page, um, you can click students and recent grads and you'll come to the, U the student and recent grad help center page. There are many different student and recent grad programs. If you wanna search internships, you can click here. It'll take you to the federal internship portal. This is where agencies get to post all of their internship opportunities. Some are paid internships, some are unpaid internships. And so many agencies will post their internship opportunities here. If you click student and recent grad jobs, what the system is going to do is pull up all the student and recent grad opportunities that are currently on USA Jobs for you right then and there. Many agencies will have their own specific student and recent grad program. So there's the PMF program. I can't speak too much to that, but that's the President Man Management Fellow Program. Um, you can Google that. There are other programs. I came under the Pathways program. So basically the criteria for Pathways and I believe the PMF is if you've graduated within two years of your conferral date, you're considered a recent grad. Anything past that, you're not considered a recent grad anymore. So it's two years. If you are a veteran, that's different. I believe it's four years for veterans. So if you are on active duty and you um, graduated while on active duty, um, so you have four years up until your conferral date to be considered a student or recent grad. But that's for the Pathways and PMF program. But there are many different additional programs. I can't speak to all of them. Many agencies have their own student and recent grad programs. So you can get some information about the PMF and the Pathways program. But if you wanna see specific ones by individual agency, you can. NASA has their own, the Department of State has their own, the Department of Defense has their own, CyberCore has their own, um, the Department of Energy. And so there are many different student and recent grad programs um, specific to agency. Again, if you wanna know what documents you need to have in your profile to be considered a student and recent grad, we'll let you know that um, there as well. So I hope that was a good overview of the um, of the uh, student and recent grad program. Yes, yeah, so if someone graduated from undergrad in the summer but started graduate school right away in the fall, am I considered a recent grad? Yep. So I did the same thing, Rennie. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, I went right into my master's program. So I graduated with my bachelor's degree and I started my master's maybe two, two months later. And so I was still considered a recent grad because I had a degree and it was still conferred within that two year period. So yes, um, even if you start another degree right away, you have still graduated with a degree already and you are still considered a recent grad. Great question. So yeah, um, I see that there's another question about documents. Um, so yes, you should upload all of your transcripts. So in my um, profile, I have my transcripts from my undergraduate. I have my transcripts from my graduate degree. Um, I have a couple of certifications that I've kind of taken along the way. And so I want to showcase my education and my experience to those agencies when I'm applying. So I am going to give them more and um, you know try not to give them the bare minimum. So I, I, I will never say uh, less is more. Um, you want to showcase your talent and your abilities, and you want to showcase you know all of the education that you've acquired along the way. So yeah, please upload all of your transcripts. At least I would. That is my per personal preference. Um, I'm still reading through the chat, so give me one second. Someone asks, how far in advance do you think we should apply for a desired vacancy? So if you see a vacancy that you really want to apply for, I suggest you apply right away. There are some vacancies, not all, but they, there are some vacancies that do not actually have an end date, but they have an end closing time based on applicant count. So what do I mean by that? There are some vacancies that will say, after we've reached the hundredth applicant, we are going to close this vacancy. That's not with every vacancy, right? 
Um, so I would suggest that um, at least when you see announcements like that, that have a particular applicant count, you, you want to apply right away. If the vacancy has a closing date, or like a hard closing date, and you want to prepare to apply to that opportunity, then, then yeah, at that point, it's really, it really doesn't matter when you apply at that point. Um, but I, what I would say is give yourself time so that you're not rushing through the application process. You don't want to be, you know, 11.59 on closing night of that application trying to rush to make sure that you're sending your application through. So give yourself some time to apply, um, but make sure that when you are applying, you're looking to make sure that it doesn't have an applicant count close um, and it has a closing, a hard closing date. Um, let me see. So there is a question for someone, um, maybe someone in CFTC can answer. Someone is asking if there are any specific programs from CFTC for current students to apply on USA jobs. So I am going to continue going through some of the questions. If you have any additional questions, please let me know. Um, I'm still looking through the chat. So I am not hiring. I see um, there is one question um, for someone that is looking for a portfolio specialist. Um, so what I will say is that um, come into USA Jobs and look for those things in the search criteria and see what pops up. Um, but I am not a hiring manager, and so I am not particularly hiring. Um, so there are some positions someone asked in the chat about those long periods where agencies will have um, a long open and close date. So there's some agencies that hire in seasons, right? So one agency that I can think about um, is the IRS. Um, tax season is usually right, you know, after we turn the year, January is when people start getting their W-2s and start filing their taxes. And so that's a heavy, busy time for the IRS. And so prior to that, they're doing a lot of recruiting. And so in order to make sure that they are fully staffed for some of those really busy seasons, they will open up job announcements for long periods of time so that they can start collecting a lot of applicants so that they can gear up for some of those busy seasons. Another agency that I can think about is the Department of Education, right? Their busy um, recruitment season, if you will, is in the summertime as they're gearing up for the school year. They're looking for teachers and bus drivers and substitute teachers and school nurses. And so sometimes they'll post um, vacancies that have long extended period open and close times because they want to try to maximize the amount of people that apply to that one vacancy because they might be hiring a lot of people at one time. So I, I know that sometimes maybe as a job seeker, you're like, why is this job open for such a long period of time? It's probably because of reasons like that, where agencies, um, they have busy, busy recruitment seasons. And so they're using that as a way to get a lot of people to apply to one vacancy. All right, I think I've gone... Okay, so someone has a question about res. Again, I'm not an HR specialist, but what I will tell you is um, that you should put um, all of your work experience. Now, would I, would I put 20 years of work experience on my resume? Probably not. What I will say is that look through that job announcement and see what are the skills that you can showcase that you've done at a high level through your years of experience that you want to showcase on your resume. I have lots of experience. I was in the military for some time. Um, prior to that, I had some work experience. And so some of my experience has changed. When I was in the Navy, I was a dental assistant. I'm not particularly working in the dental field anymore. So I kind of omit all of that stuff from my resume because it doesn't really align to what I'm doing right now. So there are some things that you can kind of cut out if it's not fully aligned with where your career is going right now or what 
what you're trying to do into the federal government. But if you've done the same thing, let's say for 10 or 15 years, you can showcase, you know, that you are now an expert at that particular level and you can start to showcase some of your expertise in your resume. What I will say is important and in the resume is talking about how long you've done that work. So in the federal government, sometimes we are working in a particular um, pay pay grade for a year. If you were in the military, you kind of are familiar with pay grades. So we work in our pay grades for a year to qualify for the next pay grade. So if I if I work as a GS7 for a year and I work at a satisfactory um, level, I could be eligible for an eight, whether that's within my current role or me applying to a GS8 position on USA Jobs. And so that's kind of how we qualify our time. So what's really important as a job seeker is that when you're putting that experience on your resume, you're letting that HR specialist know how long did you do that? If you supervised and managed product projects and you were a project manager for a couple of high level projects and you did that for for five years, that's a good amount of time to say that you're an expertise as a project manager or facilitating teams. And so you want to showcase how long you've done that. So what's important to have in your resume is not just what you did, but how long did you do that? Because that's how we kind of, I wouldn't say qualify, but yeah, kind of qualify our time here in, in the federal government. So great, great question. Honestly, it doesn't take that long to um, complete your profile. If I, if you come back to my profile right now, you put your contact information here. You can put some demographic information. Um, none of this information goes to hiring managers. This is just a way for an agency to try to make sure that they are actively recruiting all different groups of folks. Um, so I highly in, um, encourage you to fill out your demographic information. You select your hiring paths fill out your work experience. If you do all of this, USA Jobs will actually build a resume for you. And you can upload a resume also if you want to, but I highly encourage that you just fill out this information because then we just build the resume right there for you. If you're a military um, service member, you can put your military experience, um, your work experience here, your education, um, your languages and your organizations if you have any affiliations. And it's, it really does not take that long. But what I will say is don't rush it. If you're looking for a job, seriously, you know that looking for a job is finding, you know, a job is kind of like looking for a job. And so I would spend the time to make sure that your profile is right the first time and then go ahead and start applying for opportunities. And then once your profile is really good and up and running, it's nothing to apply to a job after everything's uploaded in your profile. So spend the time to make sure that you have everything going the right way. Um, I can't speak to CFTC telework, uh, but I do see that question in the chat. Um, someone had a question about um, what is CFTC. So your um, Tanisha asks, how can I upload three <clears throat> different transcripts and I only have 10? So, well, so Lauren, that was a question from a panelist. Oh, I mean, not, excuse me, from an attendee. Okay, um, the, the multi-document question. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so in order to upload um, multiple documents in the same category, you can do what I did. I just scan them all as one document. Um, so instead of taking up all of these slots that I have, you only get 10 slots to upload additional documents. And so instead of uploading one for your bachelor's or one for your master's or one for your PhD, just scan it all as one document. Um, you can scan it into one PDF and you can upload it as one document. Oh yeah, so I can show you how to set up um, announcements for CFTC. That is a super awesome suggestion. So if you come to USA Jobs and you type in CFTC, right? Remember I told you in the beginning of the presentation, you can actually search for jobs by agency. So if you guys are interested in opportunities with CFTC, so if once you type in their acronym, they'll automatically pop up. 
Once you're at this page, you literally can click save this search. And then I can name this search CFTC jobs alerts. I can set it at a daily rate, a weekly rate, monthly rate, click save. Now that it's saved, I can come to my view save searches in my dashboard in my profile. And now I have my CF TC jobs alerts. And what's going to happen is every time this agency posts a new job, I'm going to get an email notification letting me know that a new job has just been posted by this agency. And then you can go into USA Jobs. So that is great. Oh, sorry. I will definitely repeat the questions before answering them. Sorry. Okay, so someone asked me, can I show you how you can view assessment questions prior to applying to the position? So that's great. So what's really great, um, let's say I was looking for nursing opportunities. I can come to USA Jobs, type in nurse, and then I'll get a bunch of nursing opportunities open to me. Um, every agency will post assessment questions, but sometimes they post them in different places in the job announcement. So let's see if we can find it. Um, but what's really great is that you will be able to see, see if I can find it. That is the only bad thing. I'll be fully transparent. Agencies can put this link anywhere within the job announcement. So it's not always in the same place. Um, but this is why reading the job announcement is really important. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, here we go. See, it's right here. So preview the questionnaire, click here. So I kind of had to hunt for it. Again, I wish it was in the same place every time, but again, that's why you should really just read through the job announcement. But what's really great is that you can preview the questionnaire prior to starting your application, which I like, because then you can prepare yourself for how you wanna answer these questions. So if I click on this link, I'm going to come to another page where I'm going to be able to view the assessment questions and review some of these questionnaires. So I'm able to kind of prepare myself prior to applying. So again, agencies will put this link in their job announcement so that you can review the questionnaire. Again, I'm sorry, it's not always in the same location, but again, it is in the job announcement. So read through that job announcement and then you'll be able to read through and preview those questionnaires prior to starting the application. Um, if you want to see if the job is telework eligible or remote eligible, um, you will come up here. There's some job details. Again, it's right here on the right rail. So again, we have the pay scale information, the location of the job. Oops, the location of the job. If the job is remote, it will tell you right here if it's a yes or no. If the job is telework eligible, meaning that you can work from home some days, it will let you know if this job is eligible for telework or not. If the job requires travel, it will let you know as well. So all of those details are in every job announcement. If you have questions about your application or you just have questions period about this job announcement or anything, every job has contact information. So there was a question in the chat about showing you how to contact the agency. So for this particular announcement that you see on the screen, if I scroll down, there is a contact section. how to contact the agency. And so sometimes there'll be different information there. There might be an email address, a phone number, maybe an address. Um, so anytime you have questions about the vacancy, maybe your application status has not changed and you wanna get an update about what's going on, um, you can contact the person on the job announcement and you can get an update about your, about you know maybe your application or what's going on with the job announcement. 
if you would like a reasonable accommodation to your application process, that information is also in the job announcement. So there's a fair and transparent portion of every job announcement where if you need a reasonable accommodation, we'll give you information on how to request a, re a reasonable accommodation to the application process. As you're applying for opportunities in your dashboard, you can look, your, look through your applications that you've applied to. And so every application has a status. So if the job is closed, you'll see that it was closed. If they were in the interviewing phase, you would see that information there as well. So right here in my particular profile, all of the jobs that I've applied to, they're still accepting applications. And so you can check the status of the job um, from your personalized dashboard. Um, and I believe those are all the questions that I've gotten in the chat. Um, if you have any other questions, you can continue popping them in the chat. Great. Thank you so much, Lauren, for that presentation on navigating USA jobs and for taking the time to answer some of our attendee questions. I want to note that there are a number of questions that were CFTC specific about student and recent graduate opportunities and, and telework and tell me more about the CFTC and uh, stay tuned for our panel discussion that's going to start uh, just after a short break where we will have CFTC staff from every operating division including the Office of Chief Economist uh, to discuss CFTC career paths and their journey and tell you more about the experience of the CFTC. I also saw that there was a question about teleworking. The CFTC offers flexible schedules and teleworking uh, pursuant to agency policy. So we do offer those types of work-life balance opportunities. And if you have any more questions for Lauren before we break, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm just going to give you a few more moments before we lose Lauren. There were also some specific questions about uh, how to set up and prepare your federal resume. And those questions will be answered tomorrow by uh, Lauren's colleague, Anamini, who is going to do a presentation he is from a, a talent acquisition specialist from the Office of Personnel Management, who is going to do a presentation specifically about how to write a federal resume. So please come back tomorrow afternoon for that presentation and, and Amini will take us through uh, the specifics of preparing a job resume. Um, I'm just checking the chat here briefly. Okay. I think that there are, I don't see any further questions specifically for Lauren. So I just wanna again, thank you so much, Lauren, for this important and timely information. Lauren, would you mind making your information available for those questions that maybe we accidentally missed in the chat or for any questions that our, uh, our students and recent graduates may have not had a chance to ask? If you wouldn't mind dropping your information in the chat, that would be great, Lauren, um, or the contact information for USA Jobs. Thank you so much, Lauren. No problem. Now, and I encourage everyone to send us emails if you have questions about USA Jobs. Um, and there are other additional sessions that we host that we post on the events page like we talked about earlier. So definitely send us your questions. Um, and thank you guys so much for having me today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lauren. And Jerry, yes, the federal resume presentation is tomorrow afternoon at um, someone from my staff needs to drop, please drop that in the chat. I believe it is at two, two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. All right, so we're going to take a 10 minute break Please come back and join us uh, 
as we will resume right after that break with a panel discussion, as I indicated, on CFTC career paths, moderated by the CFTC's Siobhan Kirshaw, Senior Innovation Advisor in the Office of Technology Innovation. We'll see you back here at 3.05. Thanks, and we look forward to our panel discussion shortly. You don't wanna miss it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to our visitors and guests. Welcome to the CFTC Career Forum sponsored by the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. My name is Siobhan Kershaw. I am the Senior Innovation and FinTech Advisor within the Office of Technology Innovation at the CFTC. And I have to tell you, I'm delighted to serve as your moderator for today's exceptional panel of experts who will offer diverse perspectives from across the commission. Before I proceed, I'd like to thank our Chief Diversity Officer, Tanisha Cole Edmonds for the invitation to moderate today's panel. I appreciate her leadership and the great work of her team, including Derek and Kim and Kamar and Sarah. So thank you all for the invitation to join you today. Really today marks a pivotal moment for aspiring professionals, right? We are honored to guide you on a journey into the evolving world of financial markets. And so as you navigate through these opportunities, it's important to remember the words of Nelson Mandela, who said, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Your pursuit of knowledge has brought you here, and hopefully a spark is ignited today that can take you further. Since today's conversation is intended to be an open dialogue, we invite you to submit your questions in the chat. In anticipation of your questions, I want to mention that immediately following this panel, we will have human resource specialists available to discuss the student hiring process in detail. So with all of that out of the way, let's begin. We have an exciting lineup of panelists eager to share their career journeys with you. And I'm happy to invite them to turn on their cameras and join us, starting with Kate Servany, Project Manager for the Division of Administration and IT. Kate, Hello. are you with us? Yes. Great, good to see you. Hi. Tamara Durvin, Auditor for Market Participants Division or MPD. Hi. Hi, Tamara, good to see you. You too, Siobhan. John Hill, Risk Analyst in the Division of Clearing and Risk. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, John, good to see you. Good to see you too. Rob Howell, Deputy Director of the Division of Enforcement. How are you doing? Hey, Rob. Lee Hong. I'm sorry, Lee Hong McPhail, Research Economist for the Office of the Chief Economist. Lee, are Hi. you with us? Hi. Judith Slowly. Oh, great. Okay, we can hear you. Yes. Next, we have Judith Slowly, Futures Trading Investigator for the Division of Enforcement. Judith, are you with us? I am. Greetings to the room. Great. Great to see you. And rounding out our panel is Jennifer Victon Riffin, Senior Counsel and Policy Advisor to the Director, the Division of Market Oversight. Jennifer, are you there? I am there. Hi, super happy to join. Um, because I'm filling in for Sebastian, that was actually Sebastian's title. I'm Special Counsel in the Compliance Division in uh, the Division of Market Oversight. Wonderful. Okay, so we still got DMO involved, and I'm so glad that we have your, your perspective to share. So instead of senior, we've got special counsel, which is even better. I, we appreciate that. So let's dive right in to all of our panelists. We'd love to hear your, your story about your journey. Can each of you share with us really your career path to your current role? Love to hear about your arrival to the CFTC. 
And Jennifer, you're on screen for me. Would you mind starting? Of course, happy to. Um, so I was actually a pandemic hire. I spent 15 years in the private sector before coming over to the CFTC. Um, so in the private sector, I, I'm an attorney. I worked in a law firm. I worked um, in-house in market regulation at one of the largest deriv derivatives exchanges. And then I was in-house at a broker dealer and trading firm. And then during the pandemic, at, I'm in Chicago right now in the regional office. During the pandemic, um, there was the opportunity to join a DMO. So I joined in October of 2020 and I'm loving it. Sounds great. Is there anyone who wants to go next? Tamara, since we're talking about uh, Chicago and staying warm, would you mind sharing us your career journey? Yes, I can go next. And that's laughable that you're talking about Chicago being warm. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. As Siobhan said, I'm Tamara Durbin. I have actually been here at the commission for 18 years now as an auditor in the market participants division. And my career journey actually started actually being a summer intern. Um, I interned for three summers at a financial institution, a large financial institution here in Chicago. And shortly after graduating, I did try a little something different. I'm an accounting background. I uh, tried to do financial reporting. I really didn't like financial reporting. So the person who I actually interned for said, hey, come back and work for us. So then I started my full career as an auditor at that large financial institution. Um, I took a break from auditing when I got my MBA because I couldn't travel anymore. And I, in, within the bank in their capital markets division, I worked as an analyst slash underwriter. Um, and after I got my MBA, I worked for Freddie Mac actually as one of their lead examiners where they audited their seller servicers of mortgages. So I did that. And then I said, you know what? I can't be, you know, running like this on the road. Uh, and I explored federal service. So auditing at the federal government and I landed here at the CFTC and I've been here ever since. Fantastic story. For you to have been with the commission for 18 years, that is tremendous. I had no idea we were employing people at two years old. So. We will definitely have to start looking into our labor conditions. Uh, Lee Hong, I'd love to hear from you. What do you have to share with us about your arrival to the CFTC? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Lee Hong McPhail. Um, my career started by working in the banking industry in China. Then I came to US uh, to pursue a PhD in economics and I completed that in 2010. After that, I joined the USDA to conduct commodity research. And during that time, one of the most fun projects I worked on was to establish a framework to value a new commodity for the new environmental market called RINGS, Renewable Identification Numbers. And in 2013, I joined the FCA to build its stress testing models to assess the safety and the soundness of the agriculture banking system. I had a lot of fun building, um, testing and deploying risk models for two years. Then in 2015, I joined the CFTC as a research economist. In this role, I conduct research in derivative markets and also support rulemaking at the commission. And in 2019, I was promoted to my current role as head of academic outreach. Currently, I manage about 15 top tier academic consultants who collaborate with our economists on various cutting edge research projects. So that is my career journey so far. And thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm glad you share that. We're certainly not going to challenge you by saying who traveled the furthest to be here. My goodness, um, you've got us all beat. I thought the traffic in D.C. was bad, but traveling all the way from China to join us on your incredible research and analytical background, that's tremendous. Rob, it, it's hard to follow all of this up. Do you think you could share with us a little bit about your background? 
Sure. So um, I was a political science major in college and figured I should get some exposure to market. So I went and worked for an investment bank for two years and decided that really wasn't for me. So I went to law school and in law school decided that litigation, you know, seemed to be an interesting thing. I like law and order and movies like A Few Good Men. Um, and so I interned with U.S. attorneys and I interned with a judge and I was like, I think this is what I want to do. So in part because law law school's not cheap, I uh, went to a law firm so uh, I could make some, <laughs> some money for a little bit and get good training. And I thought what I wanted to do was go to like the U.S. attorney's office. Um, and so when I was there for a couple of years, I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. And the office that I wanted to go to had a hiring freeze. And I was worried, well, if I stay there too long, I'll sort of get sucked into the law firm vortex. And so I saw, you know, I looked at the SEC. I had no clue what the CFTC was, if I'm being honest. Um, but I knew some people that worked there and talked to them. And they said, hey, it's a really good job. So I applied and, and they took me. And I thought I'd be there for like a year or two until like what I wanted to do opened up. But um, I really liked the work. It was interesting. I got to be independent. We had fun. Um, and so somehow I've, I've been here for 12 years um, in different roles in the division enforcement. So that's how I got here. That's a fantastic background. It, listen, I'm as much of a fan of law and order as I am American <laughs> greed. Maybe one day the CFTC will be featured. I don't know who we have to talk to about getting on uh, some of these documentaries. Judith, I'd love to hear about your experience. Hi, Siobhan, and greetings again, everybody. So my path to the commission was completely unconventional. I had no financial background, as some of our colleagues have stated, nothing like that. I actually was a military spouse, had a Bachelor of Science degree, I married somebody active duty military. We were stationed overseas, and that was my first foray into the federal government. And we had a family, and with children, you need to be employed. And so when we got out of military service, we came back to New York. And while we were doing the transition process, I actually saw a job opportunity at the Division of Enforcement. Came over, did the interview, and eventually I was hired as an office automation clerk. That was 25 years ago. So since then, I've gotten several promotions. I did some education. I went back to school, got my master's of science in fraud and forensics. And that was during the time that I was an investigator and which I've been for, well, since 2004, I've been an investigator. And I also got some certifications, certified fraud examiner, certified anti-money laundering specialist. And I've also been working on numerous cases and I'm still here enjoying the work learning new things about the agency and, and even about the markets that we try to ensure that um, the integrity is maintained there. That's my story. That's a beautiful story, Judith. 25 years at the commission, that is incredible fortitude. Wow, and talk mm -hmm. about an unconventional path forward. Um, that's remarkable. We, we definitely wanna hear more from you later on. These are incredible stories as we're seeing in the chat. Kate, will you help round us out? And then John, after Kate. I think you're still on mute, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I also have a bit of an unconventional story of how I got to the CFTC. I did not go to law school. I actually majored in English literature. And when I graduated, I worked as a technical writer for a national nonprofit for about five years. And I moved to DC and got a job. It was one of those not to exceed three years jobs. So it was a federal job, but I knew it had a deadline at the Library of Congress, which as an English lit major was a dream come true, right? Like it felt like working at Narnia. But I knew that the job was, was temporary. I was there for a specific project. And so I was looking and I saw the job advertisement on USA Jobs for the CFTC, which I had never heard of before. And the advertisement was for a policy writer. And I mentioned that because I hadn't written policy at that point. I'd done just about every other kind of writing. I had lots of communication lots of I technical writing, mostly technical writing, lots of different communication, marketing, 
but I thought I've done everything else. I can definitely do the policy writing, even though I didn't specifically have that on my resume, I applied anyway. And when we interviewed, uh, I got the job, which was a thrill. And so I mentioned this because even if you don't fit a hundred percent of what it looks like they're looking for, um, if you can do it, it's go ahead and apply, like reach for the stars. It was worth it. It was very exciting. So I came onto the CFTC as a policy writer in the IT department. Uh, it turns out there's all kinds of policies that has to do with your computers. There's all sorts of ways we can mess things up with our computers. So we have a whole lot of things to make sure we don't do that. And while working as a writer, you end up talking to lots of different people. And that is how I moved into project management. So what I do now is I lead the project, I lead the team of project managers, and we're almost an in-house consulting group. So we don't do every project in the CFTC, but if there's several teams involved, if it's particularly complex, if it involves reaching across barriers of any kind, either between different organizations or new technology or something different, then a project manager from my team can be employed as sort of uh, someone to keep track of everything who is not totally invested in one particular way of doing it. We just want it done. You know, we, we don't care how you skin the cat. We just want a skinless cat at the end of it. So uh, I will mention that what I have found to be most useful in every job, and I have gotten or been offered every position I've, I've interviewed for. I definitely have not been interviewed for every job I applied for. I think I applied for 300 federal jobs, but I have been offered the ones I interviewed for. And I mentioned that because no matter what you do, you need to be able to communicate what you're doing with other people. Sure. If everything is happening in your head, it will stay in your head and it's not actually useful to anybody else. So even though I don't directly do writing now, communication skills, like you can be a coder, you can be a lawyer, you can be economist, but uh, learning how to talk to people, how to explain complex topics in a way a lay person can understand will serve you and advance your career. I would put it in the t and, and learn how to keep your cool when everyone around you is losing theirs, I would say is the top two things to yeah. remember and that will help you advance. Yeah, well, Kate, it, we've got to give the other panelists a chance to give their feedback. That is a fantastic start because you're absolutely right. Those technical skills, those communication skills are top notch and they are transformative across uh, occupations. So kudos to you for already recognizing that. And you're absolutely right. You're one of the top technical writers in the commission. Oh, I can attest to that. John, it's very hard to round out this panel. I mean, you've got <laughs> 25 years to beat for Judith. You've got distance, uh, all kinds of research and doctorates. <laughs> round this out for us, please. I, I don't know if I can do that, but, but uh, <laughs> at least I can give a little bit of insight of what I've done. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, uh, my career started in 2001, uh, right out of college, I uh, uh, got a degree in finance, uh, and I went to work for one of the exchanges in Chicago writing market commentaries. Uh, from there, I moved up in the exchange and, and went to run one of their offices where I uh, uh, managed the physical deliveries of all of the futures contracts um, at that exchange. Um, I took my knowledge from that, got really, really uh, brave, and I went out on my own, and I traded for my own personal account, the agricultural markets, and uh, really got beat up for two or three years um, uh, with the volatility in the markets, and so I decided to go back to graduate school. Uh, fortunately, at that time, uh, uh, a large uh, um, uh, uh, a, a large uh, exchange in Chicago hired me back as an a economist for them, uh, uh, working with their agricultural products. And I worked there for quite a, uh, uh, quite a few years after I got my master's degree. Uh, I then uh, uh, stepped away from that and decided to uh, go out on my own again and uh, 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 started my own um, 
uh, consulting firm and educational firm uh, where I provided, uh, uh, you know, uh, expert uh, expertise to agricultural firms and taught some of their uh, uh, new traders how to trade and how the markets worked. Uh, while doing that, I got uh, uh, hired on by a small technology company that dealt with uh, agricultural collateral um, and uh, uh, ran that company for a while. Um, I hadn't thought about working for the CFTC, um, but in unfortunately in 2017, I got sick and I lost my vision. And during that time, um, I really struggled with uh, getting reasonable accommodations, getting help with my work, getting opportunities to move up, uh, to advance my career. And I was young. I still didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to stop working. I wanted to keep going. I thought I had a lot more in me. And I talked to a lot of my contacts within the industry. And uh, 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 a lot of people suggested I tried the CFTC. Um, I went through and, and uh, went through the process and, and uh, uh, got hired on with the CFTC. Um, I, to this date, I got hired on August of last year, 2022. I think it's probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. Uh, and also, too, I'm now working with some of the people that I worked with when I first started in the industry uh, some 20 years ago. Uh, so, but I've really enjoyed it. Oh, John, that is a beautiful story. Wow. How you have overcome so much and then to really round out your career by being reintroduced to people that you uh, first worked with in the industry. That's incredible. Uh, you, yeah. all, you all have some tremendous backgrounds and, um, you know, this is quite inspiring as we can already see from the chat. Because we have a number of questions to get through, I am going to go in lightning speed for you all and hope that you can match my pace and cadence. Tamara, Jennifer, our Shy town beauties, let's talk about why you considered working for the federal government you, as an auditor, as a senior uh, a special advisor or special counsel. You all could have chose any industry and been successful. Why the CFTC? Why a financial regulator? I can go first. Um, so really me coming, even thinking about government came from a conversation I had with a colleague at Freddie Mac. Both of us were tired of traveling and she used to work for the SEC before she got her job with uh, Freddie Mac. And she said, hey, we, we should try going back to the government. She said, I'm going to try to see, let's, let's get on USA Jobs and let's see what audit roles are available. So actually, I had applied for a role at the SEC. I got it, but I decided to turn it down because it wasn't the right grade. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. Um, so the CFTC popped up and I didn't really know. I hadn't heard of the CFTC, but I started to read about what they, what the, the industry that it regulated. And I was like, okay, I can do this. I can work with derivatives, you know. And I think someone said on the panel, maybe it was Kate, like if you don't think that you specifically exactly fit the job description, still apply, because a lot of your skills can be transferable. And that's what I brought to the table. I had audited in the financial services industry. And so my skills were transferable. And then I, I quickly learned about our industry once I got here. But me actually even thinking about the federal government came from a conversation with my coworker and she told me about like government benefits, um, the flexibility at that time we did have, a, I had a little bit of telework. It was not like how it was now, but it had a lot more um, stability in employment and also work hours. So that's some of the reasons why I even consider federal government. Oh, and the other thing is I consider a federal financial regulator because the financial regulators salary typically is higher than other government agencies. That's a great point. You also mentioned that you chose the CFTC over the SEC based on the grade. Um, so for those, I think because the CFTC valued my experience more. Sure. And, and just so our audiences are clear and, and feel free to jump in here. When we talk about grade, we're actually talking about the job classification that aligns with your experience. So in the federal government, there is a numeric, uh, career pathing that we call grading system. 
And generally it goes from grade seven all the way up to, I've seen 16s, right? And so, or 18 rather. And so typically those grades align with your experience or your education. And it also corresponds with your salary. And so when you were referring to the difference in grade, I just want to level set for our audiences. Jennifer, we'd love to hear about your choice to come and work for a financial regulator. You bet. Um, so first of all, I have great news for you, Siobhan. There is a documentary that will make you so inspired that you want to work for the CFTC. There is an episode of PBS. It's called The Warning. I it's remember from 2009. That That's right. It talks about the financial crisis. With Brooks Lee Boyer. I, 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 was, I was just checking. It is still available online. And um, I won't say that documentary inspired me, but but the financial crisis did I have a background in economics? You know, I was already in the private sector in this space so much that in my free time, I teach a class at a law school on regulation of derivatives, right? So I love this stuff. I geek out about this stuff. And I wanted to work with other people who love this stuff, who geek out about financial markets compliance. Like, we care about it. Um, you know, I'd met many other attorneys who work at the CFTC. They were all so smart, so driven, so collegial. And so I wanted to be a part of that. No, you're exactly right. I nerd out on PBS documentaries all the time. Brooks Lee Bourne is an incredible and inspiring uh, chairwoman, first chairwoman of the commission. And so I know exactly what you're talking about. So we encourage our audiences to take a look at the warning from PBS. It's a fantastic documentary about the blind spots around derivatives regulation. I want to tag in Lee Hong and John what skills and experience did you have that you now find transferable to your current position? So, Lee Hung, I know you talked a little bit about um, your research in the past, John, with you being a risk analyst. What equipped you to be here? And either one of you can go first. Uh, I can go. Um, I would like to highlight uh, three skills. The so first is skill is the skill of thinking like an economist. So as you know, the underlying markets of the derivative contracts that CFTC regulates covers everything from agriculture, energy, environmental markets to fixed income, equity, currencies, and crypto markets. So the basic supply and demand framework helps me understand every underlying market for the derivative contracts we regulate. And also the marginal cost and benefit framework help me assess various policy options and determine the best policy forward. And, and the second skill is working with big data and applying machine learning models. And the, the data set we work with is very big, which can have trillions of observations and so the ability to work with big data and machine learning models to derive meaningful insights is very important for conducting successful research. And as the last skill, I would say is the skill of writing concisely and clearly a lot of the research and the policy work involves writing. So this skill is key to contribute to policy writing and publishing research at the CFTC. So great. We totally agree with that. It, and Kate, it sounds like we're tagging, tagging up your writing skills again. We're seeing them transferable in other careers. John, tell us a little bit about what equipped you to arrive at the CFTC. Uh, yeah, there, there was a couple uh, uh, different things in that, but uh, the, the first one was uh, actually from when I, I, I started early on in my career was uh, financial statement analysis, um, you know, understanding how financial statements work and, and uh, the, the different areas and, and uh, how people report those have really helped out a lot, you know, in reviewing and helping make sure that uh, uh, some of these uh, uh, derivative clearing organizations and uh, uh, clearing firms 
um, maintain their financial uh, uh, resources uh, on that. And that sort of ties into another area that uh, uh, has really helped out was my collateral management background. Um, you know, that's uh, one of the areas that I, I uh, focus on in my current role is to make sure that there's uh, plenty of collateral uh, in the event of a default. You know, I'm just working on a lot bigger scale now, <laughs> um, you know, but it really helped me move into that understanding. You know, you got to start off, you know, the whole uh, you got to you got to crawl before you uh, walk and walk before you run. Uh, you know, I started off with the small groups and, and gradually worked my way up and, and, and taking that and really building off that over the years has really helped out. Um, the last part is, is I, I think uh, um, my overall knowledge of uh, um, that I've learned over the years of, of working with the exchange and also trading, uh, you know, in the markets uh, for myself, you know, brings in a little bit different experience than a lot of people. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things that uh, no matter how much you study, <laughs> it'll never, uh, uh, never prepare you for going in and making that first trade. So, you know, having that experience and knowing where some people are coming from, you know, when something does go wrong really helps out, uh, you know, to understanding why they get so frustrated or, or, or concerned when certain things happen. Yeah, no, and, and that's a fantastic point to make about being able to stay abreast and stay on top of these really important topics that the financial marketplace is evolving every day. And uh, Lee Hong mentioned that she monitors over uh, trillions of data models, right? And and we know that the financial marketplace has trillions in notional value. So even if each one of us at the CFTC were providing oversight, uh, we still would not go home at night. Um, I'd love to tag in Judy and talk about, you know, from someone who has worked 25 years at the commission, which is just remarkable. What is the best thing about working for the CFTC or what do you really enjoy? Uh, Siobhan, I have to say, I heard a quote recently, I think it was Martha Stewart when she was doing her swimsuit um, cover, magazine cover. And she said, you stop learning, you stop living. And I apply that same mindset to the job. So good. I really enjoy what I do. I have a good time at work. I have to say, the pay is, a bon is great, but I'm really having a good time. The markets are evolving. Financial products are coming out. Trends, trends are evolving as well. And it's an opportunity to learn more about things. You go into a room and they look at you, somebody will look at you and not know what your background is and just kind of make an assumption based on the cover when they really peel back and open up the book of who you are and find out, wait a minute, she knows a little bit about this. She knows what crypto is. She might be a little older, but she knows what crypto is. Okay. Um, it, it works to your advantage. Um, and, and the fact that the, the way the commission is set up, we have an opportunity to interface with people from different areas of the agency and to learn more about it. I met Tam Tamara, what, years ago, you know, and we... But for the agency and working on a project together, we would not have known each other pretty much. And, and so I appreciate that opportunity. That's fantastic. You know, it actually reminds me that I'd love to hear, we talked a lot about how we arrived to the CFTC, but I'd love for each of us to kind of go round robin and talk from a high level uh, about the work that you accomplish in your divisions and share with us some of the specific specifics that your job entails. Um, Rob, would you mind leading us off of that, telling us about the work you do now and some of the specifics around that role? Sure. Um, so I'm I'm in the, like Judith, I'm in the Division of Enforcement. And what we do is we investigate, we're civil prosecutors, the best way to think of it. So we don't put people in, in jail, um, but we do work with the Department of Justice and the U.S. attorneys and different states and local authorities. But basically what we do is we um, get tips on misconduct or people that are breaking the law. We investigate them. And if it's appropriate, then we sue them in federal court. Um, and we do all different kinds of cases, which is part of what's what's fun about the job. Ponzi schemes, you have a lot of, there's a lot of unfortunately frauds and scams, which we all, you know, get and know. Um, and 
And so, you know, one of the most rewarding things is you have victims, you know, there's a lot of people that prey on elderly with retirement accounts and things like that. And so we have cases and one of the things we do best is we're small, but we can move quickly. And so if, if someone's stolen a bunch of money, we can freeze those assets and hopefully bring that person to justice and get the money back um, to the victims. And so that's one of the like most rewarding things we do. Um, and, and there's all different kinds. We do crypto. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, there, crypto like wasn't on our radar. Now we've done, we're on the cutting edge of doing cryptocurrency cases. You know, all, all the stuff that's in the press, Sam Bankman Freed, all that, we're doing that. Um, and so that that sort of subject matter, what we do, um, and and there are lawyers, there are like the investigators, we have para, paralegals, we have um, like data analytics people, we have economists within, within the division of enforcement. So really any background and actually the more diverse backgrounds we have, the more useful. Um, and so I think, you know, again, we hate to go back to like law and order and those kinds of things, but I, I was the same. I liked American Greed. It's really that. I mean, you get tips from whistleblowers or from other law enforcement agencies and your job is to go figure it out. Like, did this happen? And if it happened, what can we do to make it right? And so that sort of in a nutshell is what the Division of Enforcement does. No, I love that. Protecting the American public is at the forefront of our mission, and it's so evident. Uh, Kate, will you tell us a little bit about your current role? Yes, absolutely. So I've mentioned a little bit already that we do projects. I want to give an example of a project that we did just this last year is I was the project manager for a commission-wide effort uh, led by the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion to create the CFTC's first strategic plan for diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And so the reason Ed, uh, needed a project manager or could have used a project manager is we didn't want it to be a plan that was written by a small number of people and then imposed on the commission. We also didn't want it to be a copy and paste plan that we got from somewhere else. And instead, we worked with representatives from every organization within the commission. I think we had 17. We had weekly meetings. As a group, we reviewed the data. We ran focus groups. We pulled ideas from everywhere we can find, including um, the industry, general best practices. We, I, I can't even think of how many other people's DEIA plans we read. We read all sorts of federal agencies. At one point, I made a master list of every idea anyone had ever mentioned, and we had over 200 items on the list. And we needed to cut that down to about 20. So then we led the team through going through the items. Okay, these are kind of close. These are duplicate. This is something we should do. This is a good idea, but we're not even close to that. You know, So let's see what the CFTC specifically needs to do. And then once we got a draft, we needed to run it by all of the people that needed to approve it and address their feedback and come up with a final plan and work with HR, some of the elements in the plan, including uh, included holding management accountable for things that affect DEIA that had not been uh, in there before, and making sure there are opportunities. Uh, what we found is to greatly increase transparency, that just improving the transparency of decisions and resource allocations and opportunities would go far in improving DEIA in ways that uh, didn't necessarily require extra money, right? We don't need $30 million to improve transparency of decision-making. So that was really fun. I got to talk to everybody. It took months. It took us forever. We started last October and we wrapped up in the summer. So, uh, but I love doing that. It's almost like being in college, but every six months, my life changed completely, which is great. And I'm always learning. I love that part. That's fantastic, Kate. I, I tell you, if you ever go into early retirement, and I am not encouraging it, but if you ever do, we could all use a project manager in our lives. Jennifer, will you talk to us a little bit about what you do currently? Sure. Um, so like Rob, 
I'm an attorney, but unlike Rob, I'm an attorney that never goes to court, never ever. Um, I, the Division of Market Oversight, we oversee the exchanges, so the derivatives exchanges. And derivatives exchanges are not just a business. They're also self-regulatory organizations, as we call them. They're also regulators. So we are doing examinations of um, these really important entities in, uh, in the industry. We're also writing, uh, you know, commission regulations. So writing the, the laws to, you know, implement um, kind of the, the broad strokes that you find in the Commodity Exchange Act. We are reviewing, you know, their rules and their products. Um, so, you know, everything that relates to the exchanges, that's what we're doing, unless what they're doing is so serious that we have to refer them to Rob's group. Oh, I just mentioned, uh, sorry, sure. we have attorneys mostly. We also have analysts of a couple different kinds, data analysts and uh, financial analysts and economists as well. Thanks. Yeah. And I love that you mentioned that there is a difference between uh, litigation attorneys or trial attorneys and then those who are advisors um, serving and supporting behind the behind the veil. So I, I love that opportunity for those who may say, I'm not comfortable in court. I'm more comfortable in my research, or this is where my strength is, being able to pre present the case and show precedence. So that's fantastic. Tamara? So I'm an auditor in our market participants division, and its acronym is MPD. This division primarily oversees derivative market intermediaries, including commodity pool operators, commodity trading advisors, futures commission merchants, introducing brokers, major, major swap participants, um, retail foreign exchange dealers, and swap dealers, as well as overseeing the designated self-regulatory organizations like the NFA and the CME. Um, MPD supports CFTT, CFTC's mission through examinations, reporting, guidance, and rulemaking programs. As an auditor, I am assigned a number of FCMs and swap dealers to regularly review and monitor for compliance with our commission regulations. Also, as an auditor, I participate in our examinations and reviews of the designated self-regulatory organizations. Um, one thing that I think it was Kate mentioned, um, one of the great things about working at the CFTC is sometimes you do get to participate in other projects and cross collaborate over divisions. So I was able to participate on that project team that she talked about for the strategic um, DEIA plan. So that's another thing. Sometimes you can do things that are not typically your normal everyday duties and collaborate and work on other things, learn other things. Judy mentioned about learning opportunities. Um, and collaborate and, and just get to know your other colleagues that you wouldn't typically work with across the divisions. Um, occupations in our division are, like I said, auditors, but primarily attorneys. And we also have risk analysts in our division, um, risk and data analysts and financial analysts. So that's MPD in a nutshell. Wow, that, that's a large nutshell. I, I don't know <laughs> if I would say that that's it. Judith, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do now. I know you've shared so much, but there perhaps is more. Um, actually, I do work a lot in tandem with other investigators, where I may be assigned as maybe the lead investigator or helping another investigator as a secondary investigator to a, a, a matter that they've been working on. Um, we also get financial records, which would be trading records or bank records. We summarize them. We look at them just to see what's going on. Um, we also work with other branches within the Division of Enforcement. It's not just economists and attorneys and paralegals. We also have the whistleblower office, which utilizes the whistleblower program that was implemented during the Dodd-Frank Act, which would provide monetary awards to persons who report violations of the Commodity Exchange Act. And, and if the information that these persons do provide lead us to bring an action that results in more than a million dollars in monetary sanctions, 
there may be able to receive a monetary award. And we also have a market surveillance branch within the Division of Enforcement. And we work in tandem with them because what they do is they protect market users and the public from prohibited acts such as fraud, manipulation, and abusive practices. And that branch also has analysts who review trade data, focusing on time of trade settlements, and any activity that is detected is made as a referral of a possible violation of the Commodity Exchange Act or the Commission's rules. And then we take it from there. That's one of the ways we get to our matters and information that we need to do the work that we need to do to protect the integrity of the markets. Yeah. And I love that it all comes full circle, right? That we do have programs like the whistleblower program so that you incentivize those to report bad actors and uh, they really get to reap some of the, the benefit of that reporting and it goes right back to the American public. So that is such a, a special component of the commission that I really admire. John, would you be able to share with us a bit more? Sure. Sorry, I had to get off mute there. Um, yeah, I, I'm a risk analyst in the uh, examination branch of uh, Division of Clearing and Risk, or DCR. What we do is we do uh, <clears throat> yearly exams on deliber derivative clearing organizations, or DCOs, to make sure they're in compliance with uh, the Commodity Exchange Act. So basically, we go through and, and select out, you know, which DCOs are going to get uh, uh going to have exams done each year. And then there's a team that is broke out um, for each of those DCOs within the examination branch. And then uh, a piece of each of those on each portion of the Commodity Exchange Act is, is uh, uh, parceled out. And you go in and you review those, you work on uh, determining is that DCO uh, um, following those? Are they in compliance with all those regulations um, that are set forth on that? We also, we, we do do uh, uh, in-house um, examinations, you know, each year. Of course, in the past couple of years with the pandemic going on, a lot of it's been done remotely, but, uh, uh, you know, we do meet with the DCOs, you know, uh, uh, to speak with them one-on-one uh, -on -one to go through and do that. And then there's a report written up, um, you know, based on that, you know, on anything that needs to, to be worked on, anything that's a, a high high level risk that needs to be uh, fixed immediately or anything uh, like that. We work with them to help them uh, 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 resolve those issues. Um, as I mentioned earlier too, I work uh, uh, on the collateral side. Um, I go through and, and review uh, the collateral that certain clearing houses have that they hold on to in the event of a clearing firm defaulting. Um, it's would uh, so that way in the waterfall and the waterfalls the amount of of uh, uh, collateral or money that's set up in the markets to help cover the event of a default. It starts off with the, 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 the margin money that is originally put up by whoever's trading and then it goes, you know, to the, the, uh, the guarantee fund and then goes down to, you know, what, you know, the, uh, the clearing house is going to put up on their own and then what, what type of collateral that they have. Uh, it's going through and reviewing that type, the large level of collateral that they have uh, uh, at the clearing house level, which is dealing with, um, was it uh, master uh, repo agreements, uh, working on syndicated lines of credit? Um, you know, as before I mentioned, I started off on the small side of things. You know, it, it's you look at it, I started off working with people on thousands of dollars. Then I went up to the exchange level and started working on millions of dollars. And then now working on syndicated lines of credit and, and uh, uh, repo agreements that are in the millions, close to, uh, or I'm sorry, in the billions of dollars. You know, so it just uh, keeps moving on, you know, uh, uh, I was moving up that ladder, but, you know, those types of things, making sure that, that, that the exchanges of the clearing houses have enough to cover in the event of a default. Um, also, too, within our division, I'm going to I'm going to read a little bit of this because I'm not big into the uh, 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 technology side of things. But also, too, uh, uh, we have a, a group of analysts that go through and they review uh, DCO notices that are related to hardware or uh, software uh, related issues that come uh, from the DCOs, any malfunctions that they have, any type of information or security incidents. Um, you know, they have to be reported to, uh, by the DCO to the CFTC. 
PC in a timely amount. Also to any targeted threat that could uh, impact automated systems. Uh, most people don't realize, but there's a lot of automation behind the scenes. And if you have someone come in and attack that, you know, that could shut down an entire process that could, you know, spiral as it goes along. So, you know, we help monitor that. And any technology change that, uh, you know, major technology change that a DCO wants to do, uh, you know, we have analysts and, and staff that go in and monitor those and, and make sure that uh, uh, everything's working and in compliance. John, it gets very technical, very quick when we talk about your work. So I yes, appreciate that <laughs> and description. We may have some additional question for you because I heard some acronyms there that I want to make sure our audience is clear on. But before we do that, Lee Hong, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your current role and, and what you're doing. Yes. Um, so let me start with the mission statement of the Office of Chief Economist. Um, because it guides the work of every staff at our office. Our mission has three parts. First, we conduct rigorous economic and econometric analysis of the derivative markets. Second, we publish research and analysis to increase the transparency of the derivative markets. Third, we partner with other divisions to incorporate economic reasoning and cost benefit analysis into CFTC's rulemaking. So the majority of the staff at the OCE are research economists and research analysts, and their primary responsibilities revolve two areas, research and rulemaking. So for me personally, in addition to research and rulemaking projects, I manage the academic outreach program I mentioned earlier. Fortunately, we also have our legal counsel. Um, in addition to contributing to the rulemaking, she oversees the compliance of OCE's activities, including research publications and the academic outreach program that I currently manage. So we are a very small office, but we, we work, uh, work with almost every division uh, on, um, all the major rulemakings, so. No, oh, quite exciting. And I guess I should share a little bit about my role. I'm at the commission with you all serving and working. I, I had omitted myself from all of this questioning. Um, I serve as the Senior Innovation and FinTech Advisor for the Office of Technology Innovation. Um, I love my job, much like you all. Uh, I've been at the commission for 15 years, so I, much like Tamara, I started when I was still in diapers. Uh, my remit focuses on digital asset and crypto education internally in the commission and externally. And so we also focus on fintech innovator engagement as well. What does that look like? We might be hosting a financial innovation working group to discuss maybe the president's new executive order on artificial intelligence. Uh, it might mean that we are managing a global conference among worldwide regulators on how we look at sandboxes and allow fintechs to uh, delve into spaces with new technologies without a way that harms any market participants. Or it might even mean that we participate in World Investor Week um, as panelists or speakers, or we might coordinate with the Office of Women and Minority Inclusion and uh, have conversation with the HBCU Blockchain Network uh, at Morgan State University. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to branch out, much like Kate was sharing earlier, uh, but to really focus on the digital asset and crypto space is my world. Okay. Jumping out of interviewee and back to interviewer, going back to the team, Kate, you mentioned a little bit earlier about some of your work with diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, which we know at the commission is DEIA. Can you share with us another example or even elaborate on the example you raised before uh, about um, how important that work is or how your office is fostering diversity uh, and, and equity. And John, if you have any points or tidbits on that as well, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I would love to talk about that both on a commission-wide level and then on an individual level. For commission-wide, 
Uh, in my work as the project manager for the DEIA strategic plan, a lot of it was just looking at the data and finding out specifically what we need to work on and where. Just like the federal government is not a monolith when it comes to DEIA, even within the CFTC, the divisions are not a monolith. And one of the things I was able to do was to talk with the representatives from each division who would go back to talk to their division. So on top of the commission-wide goals, which centered on things like uh, paid internships and partnerships and recruiting and transparency and accessibility, some of which uh, we're doing really well and other things we, rec we uncovered that we need to do a lot better. And I'm so glad for the opportunity to work on it. I will say one of my other roles is I am also uh, as part of the Section 508 team. Since I am embedded into the IT department in the Division of Administration, I'm in a position to be able to talk to the people. 508 is uh, often has to do with technology. So not full time by any means, but about five to 10% of my time at the moment is spent on improving our 508 capabilities and our business processes and the education. In many cases, the CFTC has the tools, but people don't know we have the tools. And so they're not going to use them if they don't know. And even if they know we have it, they don't know how to get to it. So I do feel like um, I counted once, I average about eight meetings a day. On a slow day, it's about five. On really hairy days, it's about 11 to 12. Uh, Fortunately, there's never been a single day where every single scheduled meeting happened, but I don't know which one's going to drop, right? Like one of them's going to disappear, but I don't know which one. So I got to be ready for all of them. So and, I do a lot of <laughs> that. That's fantastic. Kate, tell us what is 508 compliance for our Oh, audience? sorry. Thank you. 508 compliant is uh, relating to accessibility of technology. So for example, if you create a PDF that is based on images, even if it's an image of text, then an image reader or software that someone uses to have the computer read the PDF to them, they can't read an image. So in order for a PDF to be 508 compliant, it needs to, ha it needs to have OCR built into it. The computer needs to be able to recognize that there is text there. So there are ways to build documents that are friendly to some of the adaptive technology, and there are ways to do it so it's so it's not. Um, I don't think no no one ever builds something that's not compliant or hard to use deliberately, but it also doesn't happen by accident. You have to make sure you try to make sure things are accessible. I love that. But the intentionality is really what we're aiming for in right. 508 compliance. John, did you have a point to that same question? Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, what is it? I can't speak highly enough for the CFTC on its inclusion. <laughs> um, I haven't felt that everywhere that I've worked, uh, but uh, the inclusion at the CFTC has been uh, uh, amazing. Um, not only from the application process to the interview, um, to the onboarding process, to the day-to-day you know, the day-to-day -day work that I do, um, any type of ac accessibility that I need or any type of assistance or help or anything, all I have to do is ask for it and and it, it's provided. may not be exactly what I asked for, but it will be provided exactly what I need. And that's what a lot of people don't realize is you not, may not accident get everything that you asked for, but you're going to get what you need. So, um, and, and uh, uh, but I, yeah, from uh, the staff, um, every all the way through the entire process uh, now has been great. Um, I really do appreciate that. Um, also, too, going back to uh, one of the things that we were just talking about was is uh, uh, one of our um, desktop applications that is uh, uh, that we use in uh, um, uh, examinations is getting uh, uh, redeveloped and put into a web application. And not only was I asked to be brought along to help, uh, you know, provide my expertise in using the application, but also too uh, for bringing it along to make sure that it's accessible. You know, a lot of things that people don't realize that they take for granted, like um, 
uh, you know, coming in and, and, and saying, okay, well, this is, you know, we're going to highlight this and make this color, you know, or, or this line look this color so you can pick it out. And I, I'll raise my hand and be like, I can't see that, you know, that, that color doesn't mean anything to me. Being brought into this process and being included in that and being able to help develop this to make sure that it is accessible, not only for people that are blind or visually impaired, but for all, all disabilities has really been great. And you don't get that everywhere, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's, uh, uh, um, I will say that everyone that I've worked with uh, at the commission has been very accepting and accommodating um, and uh, has in, in included me in everything that, uh, that we've done, so. That's fantastic. But one of the things we pride ourselves on is this sense of belonging, right? We, we're all at the table. It's not a matter of fitting in at the table, it's really a matter of adding value to the table and we all have value to contribute. Okay, we are in the lightning round for our uh, scripted questions and then we will open it up to the chat. I wanna ask each of you, Rob, I'm coming your way first. What insights or advice would you give those who are interested in working in your field? So Rob, uh, you're in the hot seat first. I'm going to cheat and tell you two, but I'll go fast. The first <laughs> is for this agency in particular, don't be intimidated by derivatives and stuff. I mean, I was Googling when I applied, I remember Googling options and futures. You don't need to know that stuff for a lot of the jobs. In fact, nobody knows all the products inside and out. So if you're smart, you're a hard worker and you're like a willing learner, you're the kind of person that we're interested in. The second thing is um, and I can give an example in the like lawyer context, put yourself out there. Um, you know, so for lawyers, it's for me, it was like doing pro bono. I was a public defender, you know, getting into court, even if it was like a losing argument, go do it. Because if you can make the scary stuff less scary, you have an advantage over all the other people that haven't done it and are still scared about getting in there. So put yourself out there. All right. I, love I cheated. That. No, that's good. We'll take all the advice we can get. Hope everyone is jotting down feverishly. Lee Hong, what advice would you have? Uh, I have two as well. Uh, first, it, in this digital age, it's very important to build your digital resume early by publishing projects that showcase your expertise. For example, sharing your programs on GitHub or publishing articles on important issues you care about on various digital platforms. Second, you know, in this age of exponential technological advancement, it's crucial to keep up with the latest development in data infrastructure and analytical tools, such as the large language models driving the current artificial intelligence breakthrough. I love that. You're able to leverage some of the social media platforms and the familiarity of those platforms to really advance your career by speaking to the research you've done. That's so, so smart. Jennifer? Keep applying, even if you don't get the job the first time. Keep applying. The job I have at the CFTC is not the first job I applied for at the CFTC, not even the first job I interviewed for at the CFTC. <laughs> That's true. We have a lot of movement with our careers, so give yourself some grace. John? Uh, yeah, I agree with that one. Uh, that was one of the things I was going to say is don't give up. You keep going. I, I remember, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how many applications I've put out over the years and, and uh, you just got to keep going. And, and uh, just because you get, it, just because you don't get uh, uh, one of the jobs doesn't mean that, that it's over. Keep going on that. And I remember one of the jobs I applied for in the private industry. I was at a conference and the president of the company came up and said, why didn't we hire you? And I go, well, I applied for the job, but I wasn't hired. <laughs> and he just shook his head and walked away. So uh, the other quick thing that I would have to say is, is um, going back on what Rob was saying, is you don't have to know everything. You know, the futures, options, you know, the derivatives market is the gray area of the gray area of finance. <laughs> and and uh, you don't have to know anything. But the one thing that I've noticed is, is it focus in on one area and, and become the expert in that area. You know, that way your colleagues will know to come to you for that. And that helps set you out and aside from everyone else. Excellent points. Judith? Perfect segue to Rob's, uh, to John and Rob, what they said earlier. Find out what you're good at it or interested in and excel at it. If it requires a certification, get certified, maintain a certification. 
And as an investigator, I would advise you to pay attention to and stay on top of current events, particularly anything financial um, with their products and their trends. Because as an investigator, when I see new trends or new products, I think new ways to commit fraud to get through those new trends and new new products. So I would offer that you would take on similar mindset with that. No, that's fantastic. Great advice. Tamara? So my advice would be to look for and take advantage of internship opportunities. It gives you great work experience and helps you start to develop your professional network. Um, remember, in my story, I was offered my first audit job through the internship that I had at that financial institution. So that led to my path and my career now of auditing. So take advantage and look for internship opportunities. Love that. That's great. And we actually, after this panel, have human resources who are going to tackle the questions that talk about student hiring directly. So I know there are some questions coming through on the chat that refer to how do we get a position? Where are these jobs located? We want to encourage you to stay tuned. Kate, you are rounding out the panel here. How okay. can we finish strong? Uh, make a portfolio, put it online, five items, list when it was created, and specifically your role and get as diverse as you can, you know, what you want to do and make a physical copy and put it online, link to it in your resume so people can look at it and take that physical copy with you to any in-person uh, interviews that you have. People are hiring because they have work to do and they don't have a person to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, they want you to make their life easier. And when you have a portfolio, you can prove that you can make their life easier. They don't have to just go on faith. I love that. That is such good advice. I think what I would close with is you are a product of your patterns. So setting disciplinary boundaries for yourself takes you farther than ambition can take you. And sweat equity and sacrifice are the steps to sustainable achievement. So if you learn how to uh, work hard and uh, to sacrifice early on, it will be noticed in your career and it will take you far. Um, I will mention, you know, we do have additional conversation uh, after this panel with the HR talent management team, who is going to address some of those exact questions that we've seen in the chat that are regarding where are these positions and the vacancies. You all, today has been remarkable, our conversation around your experience. I am so thankful to our panelists for your time and your talent. To our audience, we hope that today really served as a catalyst for your journey in the financial realm and that you saw today as an investment in yourself. You see what I did there? The play on words, it, it, trying to be cute. So I encourage each of you to embrace the possibilities, forge some new connections, reach out to us. I think most of us on this panel are on LinkedIn and let your ambitions soar. I yield back our conversation to our chief diversity officer, Tanisha Cole Edmonds for her remarks. And I know that we will have a 10 minute break as we prepare for the next session on uh, internship opportunities. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great afternoon. Siobhan, wow, always the consummate professional and an amazing moderator. Thank you so much. I did see one or two questions in the chat that I, you know, I wonder if our, our remaining panelists have a moment to answer. Um, one is, most people get discouraged when they hear no or get denied. What was the motivation for continuing to keep applying until receiving a job offer? Did, did anyone have any thoughts on that? I, I, have, I have two that I can do pretty quickly. As far as the motivation, I mean, that's all like fairly personal. Like I, I've gotten rejected from stuff. I mean, but if you're in a job that isn't what you want to do or want to be doing, you don't see a future there. 
you got to keep applying and keep trying. One thing I'll tell you being on the other side um, and doing hiring here, you know, we get the, the opportunities are so precious at the CFTC when we um, get to hire. We see so many fantastic candidates and it's ridiculous that we have to pick like one or two when there's like five that would be absolutely fantastic. And so that's why all of us on this panel beg you to keep applying because a no from us doesn't mean that you wouldn't be, you know, a superstar at this agency. It's just, you know, we only get to pick however many um, and, you know, we, we might need another cycle to be able to give you that opportunity. So I, being on this side, I think is different than when I was getting rejected because it's not fun. Um, but just know, you know, a no doesn't really, you shouldn't take it too personally necessarily. Tanisha, I'd love to just mention the yes, commission please. also offers student volunteer opportunities. And while the paid opportunities are probably the most advantageous for most folks, if there is an opportunity for a student who can volunteer their time during a winter break or a spring break, it allows them to gain some experience and a little bit of an advantage over uh, some of the competition that Rob was just mentioning. Because you get to experience the work firsthand, you also become acquainted with those teams. Um, it gives you a leg up when you are applying for the paid positions that are often offered during the summer. So. Uh, if you can sacrifice a few weeks during uh, spring break or winter break um, to work for not only the CFTC, but for financial regulatory agencies, it often is most beneficial for those students to do so. Thank you so much for sharing that, Siobhan. And just that's a, just another plug for staying with us for our HR talent management branches uh, presentation on CFTC internship and student volunteer opportunities. I do see one more question. Does the CFTC work specifically on BSA slash AML sanctions? So uh, the, the Division of Enforcement does. Um, if you look at our crypto cases um, against like exchanges, a lot of them we're suing them. This is going to get into more detail, but is a futures commission merchant. And if you're an, and that's kind of like a brokerage in the securities world. And if you're an FCM, as we call them, then you have, you know, know your customer and BSA obligations. And so while we don't necessarily bring those exact violations, we work hand in hand with the Department of Justice and FinCEN who tend to enforce those things. But if you look at like our complaint against Binance or um, BitMEX, things like that, you'll see it spelled out. Great, thank you, Rob, for that. And then Lee Hong, I see a question that is probably tailor-made for you. As a research economist, how do you keep up learning all tech software? Well, I uh, let me specifically talking about the statistical and um, analytic statistical uh, softwares, right? So the underlying logic is always the same. So when we go from like SAS to Python, um, it's just as a, the syntax is different. So it's actually, it doesn't take a lot of time, a lot. So maybe like one month, you can just kind of rewrite everything in a new software. Uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you understand uh, how the, the underlying logic really, really well. So, so just, just uh, my advice would be, uh, whatever you are doing right now, understand it deeply what you are trying to accomplish and how you are accomplishing it. And then you, it can be transferable to a new software, right? It's usually like every five years we need to upgrade our skill set. Um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Great, thank you so much. And uh, questions are coming in. I see one more here. And this is to any one of the panelists. What is your advice for someone with limited experience? And, and Siobhan, you too, as well as you have a wealth of information and advice too. Anyone have any thoughts on, or advice on that? What is your advice for someone with limited experience? I, um, go ahead. 
I'm sorry. I, I came in to this job with limited experience and I got my foot in the door by doing the administrative work, which was my strong point. I was able to prove myself and learn. Just once you get in, learn what you want to do and and work on projects if you're able to, to get the hands-on education and experience as well. That would help you in terms of saying, it's almost like an internship. If As long as you get your regular duties taken care of and you can have time and the willingness to, to learn by doing it, by doing it with a team or whoever it is, the project that you're looking at. And Kate, I'll just pass the ball over to you to finish that thought. I will say uh, very similar, say yes to everything you can. Volunteer for everything you can. I When I was in college, I volunteered at several nonprofits, some of which probably never actually helped anybody because they were starting out. We were all starting out. I don't know that we did a great job, but I worked at it enough that I could put it into my portfolio. So even if I couldn't say this is the huge amount of help that we did, I had uh, involved in all these different things and I learned something every time and I documented what I learned. My father, I, my father owned a factory before he sold it and he retired and he had this gigantic sign on the wall of the factory that said, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. Write down everything you have done. Uh, and figure out what you can take from this and say yes to everything you can. That's great, Kate. That, that's one of the pieces of advice I always give is say yes, yes to opportunity. Just, you know, say yes. So that's great. Thank you, Judith and Kate. And I, got, I have one more question. And on average, how much experience in years did you earn in the private sector before attempting to apply for the agency? And I'm wondering, that's probably going to be occupation specific, but uh, would anyone like to answer that question for I'll, Martin? I'll say I had personally seven years of experience before I um, entered as an auditor here at the commission. I will say, depending upon, I know one of the things that our chairman has talked about is building the bench. And so I know that in various divisions, they are looking for when they're starting to hire um, newer grads, they're looking at hiring at the lower grades, like Siobhan kind of broke down of where the grades are. So if we're hiring at lower grades, you would not necessarily need um, a significant number of years of experience. However, if you're wanting to be hired at a higher grade, you would need multiple or significant years of experience to be hired at those higher grades. But definitely being hired at a lower grade with limited experience, you do have the opportunity if you put in the work to continuously move up that those grade levels. Thank you so much, Tamara. Rob, I feel like this question comes up a lot for attorneys interested in joining the commission. What, what is your perspective on that as well? Yeah, I was, and not to over-lawyer this question, but it says private. Like, it doesn't matter how much private versus public experience you have. Just want to make that clear. Like, we hire people that have never worked in the private sector, um, you know, so there's not, there's not like a preference. And I just want to make sure um, that, that that's clear. And the answer is it, it depends, you know, it depends on what your experience is. Was it quality with, you know, those sorts of things. Um, we hire people that have had you know, tons of time in the private or public sector from other jobs. We hire, you know, people and we're working to hire people that are that are closer to coming out of school. So like, I'm much more into the quality of your experience than sort of the quantity. Um, and then, it, and it sort of goes to one of the other questions about sort of um, what, what about somebody who has limited experience? I mean, I sort of flipped the question around and it's like, you know, what, what do you have? What are you good at? What do you bring to the table? What, what's going to make you a valuable person? Because I'll be honest, in like hiring here, I I have a preference for like people that are smart and hard worker and willing learners, and I think that that to me personally, you know, can count a lot more than having like twenty years of experience at, at, at one thing. I mean, obviously, experience matters, and it's really valuable if it's in relevant areas. But um, I wouldn't like. For this for this panel in this group, I wouldn't get bogged down that like 
somebody else has a bunch of experience. Like my questions, what do you bring? You know, what do you do well? Thank you, Rob. And thank you, Tamara. And we have time for one final question and it's a good one. How important is it to network and do you have any suggestions on networking? I mean, I'm happy to jump in again. I think it's really important. And I think what most of us find, everybody loves, like I think people are interested in networking and mentoring and all those things. I think we're all like, people tend to be shy and don't wanna reach out. But look, unfortunately people, especially the older you get and the longer you're around, love to share their experience and talk about their paths and give advice. And so I take advantage of that, whether that's teachers or professors in school, whether you get, if you, if you do an internship and you don't develop some relationships with the people you're working with and for, like that's a huge missed opportunity. So I would say networks um, are, are really important if just for your own, like, you know, um, development and well being and all those sorts of things. And obviously it can help if you know someone who's like, hey, I know there's a job opening here and things like that. Yeah. I, I would agree, yeah. Tanisha, with what Rob is saying. I think networking, it's something that you have to make work for you in this business and any other. And regardless, if you are introverted or extroverted, there are opportunities for you to leverage that networking to advance your career. I know it doesn't appear as so, but I'm very much introverted. I would much rather be in a Snuggie at home with a cold de sac of pillows and just myself and maybe gaming a little bit. But I realized that I do have to network in order to advance career. And so what I found is um, rather than the traditional networking that happens in a room where you're talking with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, there's opportunity to network on social platforms. I mean, Lee Hong spoke very uh, candidly about leveraging social media uh, to help advance your career. And I couldn't uh, articulate that any better. I think by leveraging tools like LinkedIn, you're able to connect with people in the right industry and in the right networks and make yourself known and become familiar with those who are in decision-making positions. Um, those who are in C-suite roles that normally you would not have access to. The other part that I will mention that Rob uh, brought up is it is important to continually stay in contact with individuals. You never know where your experience as an internship will bring you. Uh, we actually have a commissioner who once interned at the agency. And many of us remember when she was first here uh, working uh, as a legal intern, and now many moons later is now leading the commission as a commissioner. And so it's important uh, to see the lifespan of your internship and the value of that experience come full circle. Amazing, thank you, Siobhan and Rob. And I will note also that our, our chairman also started his CFTC journey as an intern in our New York regional office. And with that, we are right at 4.30. Siobhan, thank you so much. You did an amazing job, as always, as a moderator. And to our panelists, Rob, John, Lee Hong, Tamara, Judith, Kate, and Jennifer, who I um, had to drop. I just want to thank you all for sharing your experience, your journeys here at the CFTC, and taking the time to offer such jewels of wisdom and advice to our students and recent panelists. I've had an opportunity to work with many of you personally during my time here at the CFTC. And I, I can say personally that you are also amazing and such great partners. And I wanna thank you for taking your time this afternoon. We are going to turn now to a 10 minute break where we will resume at 4.40 with our presentation from CFTC HR on CFTC internships and student volunteer opportunities. Thank you so much. You don't want to miss the students and recent graduates. Many of your questions are about just this topic. So come back to us at 440 Eastern time and we will see you in 10 minutes. Thank you again. Thank you everyone. So my name is Shannon Giles. I work in the Human Resources Office. I do recruitment and staffing, and I handle the unpaid internship program. 
So I'd like to share with you a little bit about the CFTC. We are the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. And some of the things that we're going to talk about today, um, this is a this is an overview. We're not going to get into some of these topics as far as benefits and the application process and um, some of these other things because you'll you'll get that later on in other presentations. So the CFTC is a government financial regulatory agency. It is commonly known as the a FIREA. Um, it was established in 1975, and our mission is actually to promote integrity, resilience and vibrancy of the U.S. derivatives markets through sound regulation. We have four locations. We are, they are in major cities, Chicago, Kansas City, New York, and our headquarters is in uh, D.C. So one of our major occupations that we recruit for are attorneys. Um, there's different levels to the attorney's position. So for this is for a... Um, a full-time position, um, this would not apply to students. These, the rules, you know, must have a JD degree and bar membership. That would not currently apply to our students, but that's for our employees. Some other jobs that we recruit for regularly are auditors, economists, futures trading specialists, investigators, and analysts. And then we have a handful of different management positions like OMWI, like HR, IT. And then we also have a student employment section. So I would like to just take some time and briefly go over the management um, professional positions. They support the CFTC's mission directly. And like I said, some of these are budget, contracting, information technology, human resources, um, there's a lots of different program managers, project managers, excuse me. And the qualifications and requirements for these positions, they do vary. Our student employment program, we have a pathways program, and this includes an internship, a paid internship program, as well as a recent grad program. We typically hire for these positions we like to put the vacancy out on USA Jobs around December, January, February, around that time to start recruiting early. What we give is we'll provide you some on-the-job training that will give you experience, professional experience. And then we also have a student unpaid internship program. So how this works is we have a open continuous vacancy on USA jobs. That means that it's open year round so that we can always collect interns resumes. And so we always know who's interested in working with us. It's an applicant list. So every month at the end of every, or excuse me, at the beginning of every month, interested parties that might have opportunities to hire an intern will receive the applicant list and they can look through it and see if the students, if there's any students in there that meet their interest. Um, one of the questions that we get is, how long do you stay on this list? You'll be on this list for six months. So you apply once and then your application is available for six months. After the six month mark, you'll get an email that says from USA Jobs that says that your six months is almost up. And if you would like to reapply, by all means, please reapply. Another question that we get pretty frequently is, is there separate lists for each region? We understand that students might physically live certain places and then go to school other places. So yes, we do take interns at DC, Chicago, New York, and Kansas City. Now, at this time, I would like to know if there's any questions from anyone or anything that you guys would like for me to go into uh, with more detail. You can absolutely write your questions in the chat. You can write them to everyone. You can write them to me directly.
Okay, so Pathways Program. Our Pathways Program, we typically hire, I would say most commonly uh, law students, as well as we've been hiring data scientists. It's a pretty new career path for our agency and the federal government as well, but we did have a handful of data science positions um, these these interns can work from six weeks up until the end of the semester, or if there's something, if they're, you're able to work something out with your supervisor, we can extend that at some points, but not always. Um, let me see what else. How does one get involved with the HR side of the house? So that's a good question. We are actually currently um, discussing putting a unpaid internship vacancy out for administrative positions. So that would be a good way to apply. You can also, my contact, um, if it's not in this presentation, it is, I can get it to everybody. Um, you can reach out to me as well, and I can have, you know, separate conversations with you when it comes to HR. How long do these internships typically run? So, um, like I said, they typically, it depends on the type of internship that you're on. A unpaid internship can go up until about a year. Um, again, there's flexibilities. One, one answer doesn't fit all. Um, is the Pathways recent graduate program available for law? school graduates and are you planning that are planning to sit for the bar to be honest i will have to get back to you on that answer i'm not a hundred percent sure what our qualifications are currently for um the recent grad law positions but i can absolutely get back to you on that um we do not have any it's the question is do we have any positions in california so as of today we are still remote as long as you're not a supervisor. So students would be remote. So technically, yes, we, um, you would be able to work from California currently. Now, if we have a return to work policy come into place, then that would affect, you know, everybody in the commission. So that things would change at that point, but we're not at that point yet. So um, yes, you could remotely work from California. Are there internships for paralegals? Um, yeah, there could be. I don't, you know, I don't see why not. Is there usually a requirement for what year undergrad you are? Um, it depends on the series itself. Each series has different expectations and different requirements. So like the data scientist will have different requirements than the a law position um, it's versus a management or a, you know, admin position. Um, should we apply using a federal resume format and template? To be honest, um, you're still very early on in your careers and you're in school. So I wouldn't limit yourself to only a federal resume. Um, I would say to put on there as much information as possible because in HR, when we review resumes, we can't assume anything. So if you can go into detail about your different, you know, things on your resume, that would be great. Do we have positions for social work students? Uh, we at, currently do not have any social work positions. Um, unfortunately, it, it's not really in the line of what we do. I'm not saying that we couldn't. Um, I would still advise um, people to apply no matter what your major is because your skill set might, might be what we're looking for and it might not exactly be... Um, always your degree related. Is it common for people to reapply uh, after each six months? So to be honest, we just tried, this is our first year um, trying this process in USA Jobs. So it hasn't been six months yet. Um, I will be able to answer that in a couple, like two months, I think it will be six months. And what is the turnover rate? Um, the turnover rate, that's that's a kind of open-ended question because we have students that come in here for six months 
in and out. They, they have a project. They know what they're working on. So it's a different turnover rate, I would say, than like a regular federal employee. Um, up to what extent age? Um, age never matters for any position in the federal government um, unless it's a, I believe, police officer and a fire Firefighter might have age requirement, um, but as far as the CFTC goes, we actually do not have any age requirements. The limited or the experience that you would that you would need, it's typically done by the level of the position. So if we hire a seven, you know, that there's going to be a lot more room for entry level experience versus a you know a nine, eleven, or you know when it goes up. Yep, we do have a suitability office. Um, sorry, guys, there's 21 questions. This is great. I'm so I'm so happy with how interested you guys are. Um, again, the requirements it, it's based on the position itself, the series and the position. Can you take an internship while working full time on a federal grant at a college? Yes, you can take an internship. Um, you would have to work out your timing with between your school and the person that you're working for, but you can certainly um, balance it if you're able to. Yep, internships are currently remote. And I wanted to thank everybody for joining and I wanna wish everybody luck on their careers and their futures.